for a short, specific time, very recently, I didn't have textfiles.com anymore. It turned out there had been some sort of hardware failure on the textfiles.com machine, and as I worked through the very weird way that I have it hosted, for that moment, it gave me a chance to reflect on having a server that I've been running for nearly 25 years and what that all means to me as the person nominally considered to be its caretaker. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd, Jeff Atwood, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Over the years, I've consolidated most of my online presence and activity onto a small number of machines, each one doing double, triple, or dozen duty for all the different projects and sites that I've had over the years, including GitLamp, BBS Documentary, Cow.net, and TextFiles.com. In many different ways, I've experienced all the myriad paths of what online presence is. Having a cage in the back of a pizza parlor or running a virtual server underneath a very, very generic host. I've also, in a few rare cases, had a machine that was hosted with another company that I would never see and would be considered a machine onto itself. Such it is with the TextFiles.com main server for the last 15 years or so. TextFiles.com, as a site, has some very specific aspects that make it difficult for me to use commodity hosting. <laughs> for one thing, there's the text files, many of them considered to be problematic or weird in some countries, some provinces, as well as the complaints I get from all different groups telling me I'm a bad person for keeping these files around. It becomes a labyrinth if people write in to my hosting provider to tell them I shouldn't be hosted by them, and as a result, I've had to move around every once in a while. I eventually found a home with a company called TQ Hosting, now called NetActuate, which has been providing me top-tier service for well over a decade and a half. It's not hard, honestly, to keep a web server up. To download Apache or NGINX and configure it on a basic Unix box, put it up onto an IP address that you have, and let the hits roll in. That has been, to various degrees, a rather straightforward process, one you can work out, read the documentation on, and make happen within a very short period of time. Now, the hard part is dealing with the edge situation. Somebody who is your caretaker, your partner, your collaborator, it doesn't really draw upon them when you have to do the day-to-day -day work. It's when things get difficult, odd, maybe even threatening, that you find out what you've signed up with. To that end, running textfiles.com, I've been visited in person by the FBI, I've received harassing, in some cases threatening, phone calls. I've had various countries write to me telling me I'm no longer welcome there because of the site I run. It's all part of the deal when you make yourself into a historical archive. How will you act when the contemporary world wants, in some way, to erase the past? I'm all for theories and I'm all for speculation, but that moment when things hit the road is where you see the true metal come out. And suffice to say, the company that I currently host with has shown on multiple occasions that they have my back. As a result, though, I'm a rather odd duck. I'm a machine that I built myself sitting in the back corner of a data center in a state I never go to. I've never seen the place where textfiles.com is hosted. I've had the pleasure of the company of some of the people who are hosting me, but 
it seems like I'll never be in the physical presence of a running textfiles.com machine ever again. So, recently, I found out that textfiles.com had gone down in a very interesting way. Somebody had called my phone number while I was in a movie, saying that he was very concerned because the site was gone. And was it going to stay down, or am I bringing it back anytime soon? Because he missed it. He wanted to know where it was. Logging into my phone to listen to that voicemail, I realized a number of emails had come in letting me know, as well, that people missed textfiles.com. What had happened? Now, it turned out it had only been down for about three or four hours, but that was enough to start raising concern. For my own part, I wasn't overly worried. I figured it was just a momentary hardware issue and it was something we could fix. Over the next five or six hours, I discovered the problem was slightly more dire. Talking with the techs who were on the ground, they told me about some very problematic disk errors that were sitting at the console of the machine and then began a process of me knocking down possibilities of what could have gone wrong and what contingencies I was going to take. This minor stress became even more of one because I was setting off on a trip, long planned, that was going to have me traveling for a week and a half. And in that moment, that realization that I couldn't immediately act on this machine that mattered so much to me, I realized how unusual this relationship between me and this machine really is. The textfiles.com machine is a simple free BSD box, an operating system that I've been running for quite some time. I find it extraordinarily stable, very easy to upgrade, and a simple matter to maintain. The work I do is basically running a web server that is constantly sending out documents. I don't keep around logs, and I don't use the machine for much else, so it's not requiring a lot of special configurations or unusual setup. But over time, you tend to make small concessions to ease of use over reproducibility of environment. A couple sim links here or there, a file sitting and running every once in a while, a shell script that runs on a regular basis, and it's very easy to convince yourself once the machine is down that you'll never be able to get it back to where it was. Or, even worse, put it back up again, not realizing how many different functions and how many special considerations you were leaving behind, never to bring them back. Like I said, this machine now runs cow.net, gitlamp.com, bbsdocumentary.com, and a whole other set of subsites that I've built up over the years, based on whim, necessity, or a feeling of duty where all the documentation for this was, how well I had backed it up, it all comes rushing back during an outage. It's so easy to forget how to set things up and how to put things back together again after they've fallen apart. The dread of looking through old hard drives and collections of tape archives and massive zip files created under whatever conditions and stored in places I've long forgotten, like some sort of amnesiac squirrel. It's so easy in that time after a disaster to realize where you may have fallen short or to question yourself as to whether or not you've done everything a person should do in preparation for catastrophe. It wasn't too long before I figured out that I definitely had files within arm's reach, that they were on hard drives and archived over on my internal machines at the Internet Archive, and they would allow me to recreate most of the sites, even if I was not 100% sure about every single one of them. I got philosophical, really, about how much of this is me, how much of the textfiles.com site being up represents my personality, my place in the world, my utility, and my meaning. Did I really need to have an old site from 1995 still running as if it was yesterday? Did I need to have my old drawings, my old writings, accessible within seconds to the Internet? I made a decision at that point that it wasn't going to stress me or ruin my trip, that I would be zen about it, that I would realize 
it was not a paid position. It was not a situation where if I didn't have it up, my many, many mirrors wouldn't make it available. That the copies of textfiles.com that I had long ago uploaded to the Internet Archive would be there. The ease of typing in the domain name was gone, but definitely replaced by the fact that a lot of people had a lot of copies of all these things that I had spent decades of my life assembling. I was going to be, in other words, fine. In that calmness, in that realization, I felt a lot of what I felt on the table when I had my heart attack. A sense of turning a corner, a pivot perhaps into darkness, perhaps into the unknown, but realizing that before that moment, things had been pretty great, definitely a life well-lived, an existence done properly, a machine left up for a quarter century. And then, in the zen-like quality of the Leviathan of my old system administration experience, I asked the tech on duty who had walked down to the machine and powered it off and on again to turn it off for about 10 minutes. Let the machine rest. Let it cool down. Let it become stable. And then turn it back on again. And to his surprise, it came up fine. The machine was functional. The drives were working. Some sort of momentary disk problem had flickered by and the system had panicked, but the journaling of the file system ensured that no data was lost, and frankly there wasn't much data to lose. Nothing new had been added to this machine for well over a decade. I ran a few tests on it and then brought the web server back up. I had stared into the abyss, the darkness of no longer being an administrator of a website, of a website that had a name via my handles, my email, my domain names. In an insight I wish to pass along to people, I realized I had never left. I, the person who had been part of this project, who had created textfiles.com out of a need to save history, wasn't going anywhere. The efforts I'd made over the years, the progress I had made to talk about all of this technological history, these podcasts that I speak in, the text files themselves being put into tar.gz files and uploaded for everyone to grab. That work had been done and was successful. It is very hard to lose BBS text files now. If they're part of the corpus of materials of the textfiles.com project, you can find them. People put up copies of the files on their Telnet-only or web-accessible BBSs. Folks pass it around on USB drives or even USB sticks. And doing searches in search engines for names that mattered to me in my teens, names like Biok Agent 003 or Minneapolis, or, were living on, were playing a part in the ecosystem of memory and history. Think of it as a skipped heartbeat, a moment of concern, a dizziness of staring and realizing that that which you could depend on isn't there for a moment. It's a feeling I've been familiar with all my life. And it was nice to know that in this most recent time, on the cusp of taking a nice long trip, that what I was leaving behind was going to live another day. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to Josiah Lucher, James Bakoyanu, Emilio Oliveira, Mark Pilgrim, Ernie Hershey, Michael Rubin, Craig Talbert, Dileep Reddy, Sean Kelly, Trixie the Cat, John Sturm, Eugene, Martin, Sembiance, and Anonymous, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. One small mention about another stress in my life. I've made reference to the fact that I now have to have a tax lawyer working with my accountant for an IRS problem. I just wanted to pass along that in a recent conversation where I was saying that a deadline was coming up, this tax lawyer told me, ignore that deadline. It's stupid 
it's not real. All the documentation is in. We've done everything we need to do. Now we wait for them to realize it. The difference between going alone and not knowing what to do next and constantly living in fear that you've made the wrong decision and having somebody you can trust and work with who knows their subject and collaborates with you, it's a world beyond worlds. Please, never be afraid to ask for help, to find experts, to make the effort to allow yourself the freedom to be helped.